Thank you for joining me today for our Bible study. We are in Romans chapter 10 today, and I would like to begin by reading just uh, a few of the first verses and then jumping down to the very last verse. It says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Then in verse 21, it says, well actually verse 20 and 21, it says, Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a dis disobedient and obstinate people. I like the way verse 21 is rendered in the New Living Translation. It says, regarding Israel, God said, all day long I opened my arms to them, but they kept disobeying and arguing with me. Now, uh, this is a passage of scripture where Paul is writing about the Jews and the Jews' hesitancy to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah and Savior. And uh, I really like the way the King James Version puts uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, uh, Paul writes and he says, uh, uh, My desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And verse 2 says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So uh, they have a desire for God. They have a zeal to know who God is or to think they know who God is. But unfortunately, they've gone about to establish their own righteousness. You know, really, the entire emphasis of chapter uh, 10 uh, is illustrated in those first few verses. Matter of fact, even though it is a popular passage of, uh, of Scripture, it is, uh, it is one that describes Israel's journey. Whenever Jesus actually came, they didn't even recognize him. They crucified him on a cross. They didn't see him as the fulfillment of prophecy. And yet, uh, Paul writes in verse number four that Christ was the end of the law. Or in other words, Christ was the fulfillment of the law. There's no reason for us to go any further than that. So Israel had the wrong kind of righteousness. And matter of fact, for many years, Paul lived with the wrong type of doctrine. He too lived with the wrong kind of righteousness. So let's take just for uh, just a moment and let's consider that. First of all, the Jews did not see a need for their own personal salvation. They were God's chosen people. Salvation was only for the proselytes. Salvation was only for those who wanted God and chose God. Uh, that was their viewpoint, and uh, it was a wrong one. And Paul himself recognized this on the road to Damascus. You know, he thought that he was pleasing God by observing the law the way that he did. And uh, God had sought to prepare the nation. You know, he sent the prophets. You know, uh, Micah told where Jesus would be born. Uh, various ones told different things about him. Isaiah talked about his suffering. Isaiah said that Jesus would come from a virgin. The list goes on and on and on the various ways that uh, Jesus was described in the Old Testament hundreds of years prior. 
And yet the Jews still missed those prophecies. They may have learned how to recite them, but those prophecies had not settled and found their fulfillment in their hearts. And so when Jesus actually came, they rejected him and ended up crucifying him. But uh, even that fulfills a statement that uh, was said in John chapter 1, verse 11. The Bible says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. I like the way John goes on to write. He said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power, even to those who called upon his name. So again, the Jews, because they were uh, God's chosen people, chosen from God's covenant with Abraham, many of the Jews misread and misunderstood something. They thought that because they were God's chosen people, that they didn't have a need for salvation. So now notice this, even though the law had been delivered, uh, the uh, following the law was just a formality for them. They didn't feel that they needed uh, a salvation because they were God's chosen people. But the Bible goes on to say that they did have a zeal for God. Uh, here we have just uh, finished uh, celebrating Independence Day. This year, the 4th of July, came on a Sunday. And uh, I have found in my lifetime, living as an American, people are zealous. They are uh, excited to say that they come from a godly nation. There are many people that only have a small connection to the church, and they will, uh, they will proclaim one nation under God when their lives do not match the fact that they are even living for God, but they still proclaim our nation as one nation under God. So here in America, we still have a uh, large number of people who have a zeal for God. They want to be identified with God as far as our nation is concerned. But unfortunately, the children of Israel, the Jews, they not only had a zeal for God, but that zeal was not based on knowledge. And they went about trying to establish their own righteousness, trying to establish their own doctrine, trying to establish their own way of thinking, and this caused them to become proud and self-righteous. This caused them to even misunderstand their own law. Misunderstand the reason why the law was there for the, for the, in the first place. And uh, everything that they had been instructed to do by Moses, it all pointed to Jesus. All of the sacrifices, whenever they would sacrifice an animal, whenever they would sprinkle the blood of that animal on the altar and sometimes even on the foreheads of the people, it was a picture of God covering their sins until Jesus could come and wash those sins away with his own shed blood. The law was a signpost that was pointing the way. Now, I want you to notice something. If you come to a signpost on the highway that points the way, so say for example, you come to a signpost on I-64 and it says uh, St. Louis, 156 miles away. Now, uh, there will, that will be a signpost, and it tells you that you're heading in that direction. But it still doesn't give you a precise direction on how to get there. Uh, and, and much is the same uh, with, with what was happening here. You know, there was more to getting to Jesus than knowing where that Jesus was the Son of God. The law was a signpost pointing the way, but the law could not take people to their final destination. The law could not get people to heaven. That's why it says Jesus Christ is the end of the law. He not only is the fulfillment of the law, but he satisfies the law. The fact that he died 
for every man, woman, boy, and girl. So, so with this in mind, uh, I, I want you to notice the step of salvation as it's described in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, and, uh, and then later on in verse 13. Notice what verse 9 it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, in verse 11, that, that uh, quotation in verse 11, that actually comes from, again, the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, verse 16. It's a quote out of Isaiah. And then it goes on to say in verse 12, there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. So, in other words, God's covenant that was once made to Abraham has been fulfilled through Abraham. You know, uh, God said one day all nations of the world would be blessed as a result of the fulfillment of God's covenant to Abraham. So it, it, it goes on to say, For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is o over all, is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever, whoever, Jew or Gentile, Jew or Greek, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, let's just stop there for a moment and turn our thoughts back to our original thinking. I want to remind you that the Jews rejected Jesus because they didn't feel a need for salvation. Uh, they, were, they had a zeal, a patriotic zeal uh, for God, but it was not based on knowledge. Uh, they had become proud and self-righteous, and they had gone about to establish their own righteousness. So they came up with their own doctrine. The Bible even indicates that uh, they added uh, they added explanations to the law. It was as if uh, they were trying to help God out. Uh, various uh, Bible scholars uh, seem to agree that they had about 400 add-ons to the law. 400 add-ons that in their mind would help people keep from breaking the law. And the reason why they felt those add-ons were necessary is the Jews felt that the law saved an individual. That it was good works that saved an individual. It had nothing to do with faith. It had nothing to do with belief. It had nothing to do with accepting God's way. So now, I want you to notice the difference. Uh, Warren Wiersbe gives us a chart uh, in his commentary, and in the chart he gives us a, uh, a comparison. On one side uh, he describes law righteousness, and on the other side he describes righteousness that comes by faith. And under righteousness that comes through the law, uh, he, he shares these misconceptions. He shares these misunderstandings. That the Jew came up with the impression that law righteousness was only for them. They were God's chosen people. Only for the Jews. Getting to heaven was based on works and based on works alone. Obeying the law alone would get you to heaven. And it was also self-righteousness. It was you determining, had you lived up uh, to the satisfaction of the law. And, uh, and so, actually, they, uh, they were confused because the law could not save them. And matter of fact, the law really couldn't help them obey the Lord and satisfy all of God's commands either. It only led them to pride. But faith righteousness, on the other hand, it was, number one, for whosoever will. It was always that way. You know, even when God was making his covenant with Abraham, he said that one day everyone would be able to call on the name of the Lord. 
one day anyone who would call on the name of the Lord would be saved. So it was for whosoever. Uh, Jesus, in his uh, a statement to Nicodemus, uh, he said, So whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And faith righteousness, that comes by faith alone. Faith in Jesus Christ and his shed blood for us on the cross. Faith righteousness is God's righteousness. Faith righteousness brings salvation. Faith righteousness, instead of obeying a long list of rules and regulations, faith righteousness calls upon the Lord. Calls upon the Lord to help us live up to those standards. Calls upon the Lord uh, for salvation. And once we have salvation and the Holy Spirit of God residing in our hearts, then it is so much easier to live up to the expectations of God. And living by the law and living only by the law, it will only lead you to pride. But whenever you live by faith, you are glorifying God with every step that you take. And so as a result of that, by glorifying God, you find out that in your life, you want to live your life in such a way that it pleases Him. Uh, a saying that I keep repeating on these recordings uh, is that Charles Spurgeon used to say, love God, then live as you please. And the truth is, whenever we love God like we are supposed to love God, we would never do anything that is displeasing to Him. So, keeping that in mind, let's, uh, let's step back just a few verses now. And, and we see uh, part of the verses that are uh, referenced as the Roman road. Uh, verses 9, verse 10, and verse 13. So let's look at those again. Uh, it, it says there in verse 9 that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we can be saved. We will be saved. So, uh, salvation is through the confession of the mouth and the belief of the heart. And if we confess, Lord, I admit, I confess that I have sinned in my life. I confess that I have violated your law. I confess that I have broken your commandments. But I also confess that Jesus is Lord and that he can redeem me from these situations because he not only died on a cross for my sins, he was buried because of my sins, and he rose again in victory over my sins. So notice that. So verse 10 then says, For it is with your heart that you believe and you are justified. The word justified, it means just as if we had never, ever sinned. And it is with our mouth that we confess our sins, and as a result we are saved. And the Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, we get an evangelistic call in verse number 14. Notice uh, uh, Paul writes, How then can they call upon the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they, not, and how can they hear without somebody going and preaching to them? And how can they preach unless someone is sent to them? And uh, then it says, as, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So uh, uh, notice that there's an evangelistic call. So uh, if salvation were by works, there would be no need for evangelism. But salvation is by faith. And so we teach that message of faith. And then we evangelize. Why do we evangelize? So that other people will come to Jesus by faith. Now, notice in verse 16, it says that not all the Israelites accepted the good news. Uh, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So, now, uh, I want to remind you of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus himself said, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
only he who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So uh, we can say, yeah, Jesus is my Savior. Yeah, Jesus is my God. But until we follow those steps that lead us to salvation, until we say, Lord, yes, I believe I've sinned, but I'm sorry for my sins. Lord, I'm confessing that you're Lord and you are the only way that I can be redeemed from my sins. Please come into my heart and live. Until we do that, we are not performing the will of the Father who is in heaven. Uh, verse 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So remember, Christ is the end of the law. That means he's the bottom line. That means he's the fulfillment. That means that uh, there's no reason to take a step further than Christ when it comes to finding salvation. So, so now notice that. Um, uh, Paul says, but I ask, did they hear? Well, of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Again, I say, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation, I will make you angry by a nation who has no understanding. Now, notice, then Isaiah speaks about the Gentiles. He says, and Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. So, now, uh, I, I want to back up just for a second uh, to verses 5 through about uh, verse 7 or 8. Uh, uh, it's talking about Moses and his description. He said, Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say into your heart, in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Now notice that. Uh, that verbiage is somewhat confusing until we go back and, and study it a little bit further. What that is saying is that if you're looking for Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, if you're looking for Jesus, for your salvation, you don't have to go up to heaven to get him. The Bible says in this passage that he is near to every one of us. Uh, uh, you don't have to rally yourself up in some mystical sort of way and get to heaven to get to him. That uh, the person of his Holy Spirit is here on earth residing among us and if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that he's here. All you have to do is call upon him. He's near to you. The scripture even goes on to say that he's not a dead savior. Uh, notice what it says. Uh, 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 you do not have to say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down to earth. Or you do not have to say into your heart, who will descend down into the deep, that is to go down and bring Christ up from the dead. You don't have to rally him out of the grave. He's already a risen Savior. The word is near to you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. And the word of faith that we're uh, proclaiming, that all you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. So that's the teaching that Jesus is bringing to us right now. He says, all day long, speaking of the Jews, he said, all day long, I held my hands out to a disobedient and obstinate people. And I believe that Jesus is saying that to us today. All day long, I've been holding out my arms to anyone who would receive me. Salvation does not come through the law. It comes as a result of the law but it does not come through the law. The law teaches us where we have sinned and teaches us the fact that we stand in need of a Savior. And there's no reason for us to try to reinvent the wheel. There is no reason for us to argue with the Word of God and the teachings of God. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what does the Word of God say? And the Word of God says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus 
And if we believe in our hearts that he has risen from the dead, we can be saved. I hope that this lesson has meant a lot to you today. I look forward to teaching you again next week. God bless you.